welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hello there, welcome to How I Got Here. As always, this is Mozio and FocusWire's weekly podcast where we meet the entrepreneurs and innovators in travel and transportation. Uh, we're delighted this week as we welcome this week's guest, that's Adlai Skalberg. Thank you very much for joining us. Bit of an introduction before we get into our interview, uh, Adlai. So he's currently the Chief Operating Officer of Flight Centre, but that's a position he made his way to after the company he was with for 11 years, Student Universe, was acquired by the Global Travel Agency Group in 2015. Uh, Adelaide started at Student University in 2005 in a marketing role before making his way to the CEO position in 2012. Lots of stuff happened after you became the CEO, not least the acquisition. Uh, you're a native of Norway, but you uh, went to study at Boston University where you still live. So again, thank you very much for joining us, Adley. We're glad that you can uh, be here on How I Got Here. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Okay. A tradition dictates that we start every one of our interviews with the same question and that is for you uh, Atlee to tell us how you got here. Yeah no I, I'm happy to. I grew up in a small town on the southern coast of Norway and uh, made my way to Boston as you said for for grad school. Uh, straight out of grad school my first gig in uh, in the US was with an MIT Media Lab startup that some of the smartest people I've ever worked with but no commercial sense whatsoever. So we, we ran out of cash <laughs> Ran out of cash pretty quickly, actually. Um, high IQ, uh, tiny pockets, and uh, we. Uh, I ended up, you know, quite frankly, looking for a visa more than anything. Uh, okay. Pay was not as important as just being able to stay in the country and explore new options here. So I started looking around, talking to people, and uh, as uh, as fate would have it, I talked to a fellow Norwegian at a very small company called Student Universe. Um, out in, uh, in Watertown, Massachusetts. And he basically said, look, why don't you just camp out at our place? It'll give you uh, an opportunity to look around. And uh, I ended up absolutely loving it, the team, the model, the business. So uh, as you said, a few years later, I was um, fortunate enough to run uh, the team and the business. And um, yeah, after, a, after an exit to Flight Center Travel Group in, in late 2015, pretty much five years to the day, I think now, um, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have, to be the chief digital officer for the group and most recently a chief operating officer uh, within the group. So that's how I got here. Now I'm in Brookline right outside Boston and uh, enjoying some uh, minus one Celsius weather. <laughs> Okay. Well, again, thanks ever so much for joining us. So um, you, you met your, your Norwegian comrade who said, come and kind of work for us. Did you have any sense at all as to what it kind of what it was? Obviously, it's a travel business, but did you have any kind of idea what you were one kind of getting into and whether it was going to be difficult or not? Or did he say oh, it's actually quite a decent job? It's quite easy. Or did you get a sense of that it was going to be quite hard work those early years? Yeah, I, I never really thought it could be. I, I never really got ex super excited about it in the beginning because it felt like a very small segment to me. Um, yeah. You know, who, who tries to go after just students? Um, but then I started putting things in perspective and realizing how, how huge these segments are. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a country with, at the time when I left, less than 5 million people. And there are more than 20 million students in the U.S. alone. Uh, yeah. So I quickly learned that these are not these are not poor individuals. Their parents are happy to pay. This is a massive segment and it's a fast growing part of the travel industry. So I, like I said before, I got increasingly excited. Uh, the more time I spent on the model, the more time I spent pitching it to suppliers and employees and partners, the more I realized that we could build a very healthy business. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty, a pretty quick turnaround, but at first it was, it was certainly not love at first sight. Okay. And um, you started off in a marketing role. Um, I started out in whatever they would give me. I would have, uh, <laughs> I would have been a janitor if I could get a visa. So right. uh, there was I no... Love, yeah. I'm loving the honesty. It's great. But uh, how many were, were you on the team at that point? I mean, it doesn't sound like it was particularly big. Uh, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't know the exact number. If I had to guess, it was 30 to 40 people at that point, but which was... 
uh, you know, not tiny, tiny, but very right. early stage in, in terms of product and revenues. And I remember those early days being super excited about what currently, even during COVID, would have been a shitty day. So it was, <laughs> it was very early days. And it was about five years old, the business, at the point when you joined it, right? Yeah, if, if, if at all. Uh, and it was kind of coming on the back of a couple of really sluggish first years. So it was, to, the, to my point, very young and, and very early stage. So it felt to me very much like um, a, uh, a slightly more established two guys in the garage. And um, I mean, last one from me for a moment, but uh, you know, the, the, the founder and the CEO was Norwegian, your Norwegian. Was it a, a, a multinational company or were you the only uh, uh, Europeans or Scandinavians there? No, it very much was. It's, it's the beauty of Boston, the beauty of many U.S. cities, yeah. obviously, but we, we had you know, numerous nationalities, uh, languages spoken, and a culture that, um, it's actually a phenomenal point. It was one of the biggest appeals to me coming from a super homogenous, tiny coastal town where everyone's blonde and blue-eyed and white. It's, <laughs> it's kind of extraordinarily boring. Um, and all of a sudden, there are, there's just thriving environments. So that was a, that was a big part of it. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for joining us, Atla. I wanted to ask you, so you mentioned how, you know, Norway is 5 million people and students in America are 20 million. I, I think, you know, it begs the question, how do you appeal to those students? So it, it reminds me of what I've heard stories of Momondo, you know, tackling certain European markets with, you know, TV advertising. And it was because they, they detected that there's, this is how, you know, they should appeal to this particular culture. So I feel like, you know, what was your, your guys' insight or how would you actually market differently to students? Yeah, I think I think we we got a clean a clean unique value proposition right from a relatively early stage where it was simple language along the lines of look you get better term and better pricing because you're a student. We were riding the wave of kind of the socially acceptable co uh, concept of student discounting. So it wasn't entirely a new concept, but that was at the core of what we did. I think we pretty early learned some lessons around kind of um, preconceived ways of marketing to young people, not, not at all being what we found to be successful. So uh, there was, we constantly heard from, you know, potential suppliers, partners, and so on that, you know, these guys are, are piss poor. They don't have the money to travel. They don't, they don't think that way you should do on campus physical events. And the more we, the more we experimented with marketing, the opposite was true. They're actually, you know, relatively, tech dependent, sophisticated uh, searchers. I mean, they may have been first time travelers, a lot of them, and, and not you know savvy travelers, but they were pretty savvy with the tools of finding the right deal. So it was you know 90% digital marketing and it was the, the usual suspects, you know, paid, uh, social, SEO, so on and so forth. Well, so I'm curious, you know, this is actually kind of jumping ahead a lot about, you know, what the future is. So I feel like if you're targeting students, you just mentioned that they're all really socially savvy. And I feel like every two to three years, you have a new platform that potentially you might need to engage with. And so, you know, I don't want to be so, uh, you know, okay, boomer as to be like, are you advertising on TikTok here? But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it begs the question for like how, like, I almost feel like you probably need to be on the cutting edge of every single you know, new way to market and appeal if, if these, you know, kids are, are doing that themselves. Yeah, I, I would, I would argue it's been, that's been exponentially more so the case in the last five years since I left, left as a CEO. So the, the team that's currently actively running the business probably have a greater challenge. Uh, if you think about even Instagram and, and Facebook, uh, Facebook probably less so, but even Instagram and TikTok and other services only five years ago were, were less mature, certainly from an ad and social commerce perspective, but they absolutely need to be at the forefront. Uh, we're constantly trying to follow, which is a full-time job, constantly trying to follow where students spend time, how they think about engaging with brands, uh, but perhaps most importantly, how they think about transacting. Because um, another mistake that we made multiple times um, early in the game was really thinking more about where they spend time than where they transact. And it turned out that, you know, certain platforms back then it would be um, it would be you know early day competitors of Facebook um, that they spent a, a ton of time on, but they didn't really think of them as commercial channels. So it didn't lead to meaningful leads or business. I feel like that's almost kind of like the 
the holy grail of trying to get as far up the travel funnel as possible into travel inspiration. Exactly. Like <laughs> ending up with people realizing that people are still two months away from buying the hotel where everyone makes all the money. Um, yeah. So, how, how many travel inspiration startup pitches have you listened to? Oh, there's like at least five every focus right, I imagine. Right, yeah. Kevin? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> all I know is that it's broken. That's, that's... Yeah, exactly. And you have to go to <laughs> no, the whole different of travel websites. Is, the whole of travel is yeah, broken. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's true. 28 different websites to plan one trip. Um, anyways, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of, uh, I, I think, I don't want to say this is the elephant in the room, but like the, uh, when it comes to student travel, very recently SDA travel went bankrupt. And I remember I went to UC Berkeley and there was an SDA travel uh, on campus in the kind of the, with the student center. Um, and I never really used it. So, you know, it's probably a hard banger of their impending doom, but um, my, you know, I, I'm curious, you actually alluded to how some people recommend you do on campus physical events. And I was one, one, number one, one, if you were alluding to the SDA travel there yourself, um, but kind of, you know, I think we've we've had some high profile bankruptcies, you know, that COVID probably pushed them over the edge, but in this case, but previously there was Thomas Cook and these were traditional models that just did not translate over well. And I think some of the, the SDA was a very original traditional student travel model. So could you elaborate maybe on like, wh where did they go wrong and how did you correct for that? Well, first of all, and, and this is heartfelt, I'm not saying this, I, I'm not a very politically correct guy, but it's, that is not a good thing for the youth and travel, uh, youth and student travel uh, segment. Uh, we, we didn't want that to happen. We don't want our, even our uh, toughest competitors to go under. I, I think that's actually a net negative for youth and student travel on a whole, because a lot of the contracts and the benefits and the terms that were negotiated for the youth and student space um, STA travel over the years, the last, you know, 30 plus years helped produce volume, interest, engagement with suppliers and, and obviously travelers. So that's very unfortunate. Um, I, I think the, the space is probably the most, as you would expect, cutting edge when it comes to e-commerce, social commerce, and mobile adoption. I don't typically, not to be pedantic, I don't typically think about students as necessarily tech savvy, but they're tech dependent. Um, and as there's actually a massive difference, um, but they, they don't necessarily gravitate to physical retail in-person engagement uh, for, for simple transactions. And, and they're just at a stage in life where they don't do many complex or super emotional transactions uh, for, for monetary and other reasons. So uh, it's unfortunate it was, it was not unpredictable. Um, there are other models um, that, that some of which you mentioned that have gone through some real hardship. Uh, unfortunately, I, I happen to be in a group that has experienced a lot of the same turbulence through COVID as I know this pain all too well. Um, I, don't, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. Uh, I think hybrid or a mix of human uh, higher, higher human touch services with a really solid base of technology I think there's still a massive market for that and, and one of the largest industries in the world. Um, there are there will remain, and probably more so post-COVID, uh, some insane segments when it comes to emotional, complex purchasing. Uh, and I think we're decades away from, you know, machines and pure utility e-commerce solving all those problems. Uh, where some got it wrong, if I can be that blunt, is probably uh, not not having any form of meaningful uh, technology products facing the consumer and, and just falling way too far behind when it comes to servicing the basic transactions and the self-service that everyone would expect these days. I, I, I'm curious to go back to where we were before you joined in the marketing role or as you said, whatever role would, uh, would uh, sort your visa out for you. But I mean, there was a six, seven year gap between that and you becoming the CEO and you went through a number of roles. Would you be bold enough to say that you were quite ambitious and had your eye on the prize as it were, or was it more of a, more like fate that took you from where you entered until you took over the top job? Uh, it's probably a bit, a bit of, a bit from column A, a bit from column B. I think mm -hmm. without being ambitious, it wouldn't have, the opportunity wouldn't have presented itself. Um, yeah. But you also need fantastic, you need to be fortunate enough to have fantastic mentors, in this case, uh, a founder and a board that believed that, you know, a 30 something or not even 30 at the point could yeah. could actually 
you know, play a role in, in giving investors a good return and, and the, the team and the company a bright future. So a lot of it is, is, is good fortune. Um, a bit of it is hopefully hard work and, and, and talent, but um, I think uh, the, the factor we don't necessarily talk as much about, certainly not in Europe where I, um, where I grew up and, and got my first college degree um, is really culture. Um, and that's something that continues to be pretty unique about the, uh, about the American culture, you know, having the fortune of being in Boston is giving that 29 year old the chance to do it um, and actually taking the chance on that. And what did you, I, I'm always interested in the idea and the role that mentors play. So in that intervening period from when you started until you, you took over, what was some of the, the, what was some of the best advice that you got from your mentor, the founder of the business? Yeah, I, I think, so I, I have this, uh, I'm, I'm kind of giggling and smiling because I have this uh, crazy relationship with mentorship. I'm, I've been spending the last 15 plus years actively engaging with a handful of mentors on, a, on, a, on an annual basis and, and creating a bit of structure around it. And colleagues and friends will make fun of me for always recommending, hey, get a mentor. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's insane and how, how good it is and how even people that you have looked up to your entire career and you think are out of reach, if you simply ask them, hey, do you mind if we do a 20 minute call once a quarter? Uh, almost without exception, they will they will not turn you down. So I yeah. could not recommend that enough. Um, look, I, I think very often it has nothing to do with work. Um, it's advice around how you get a work life balance. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was stop reading business books. Um, <laughs> read more. <laughs> no, seriously, the, read read more interesting stuff. Um, expand your horizon. Find parallels in in, in fiction. Um, another piece of advice, which I, which I've always taken as the simplest piece, but it's so, it's so good is just ask. And it's so true. Um, yeah. whether you're doing diligence on a company that you want to acquire and you're wondering, you're having all these kind of back, back room conversations about, Oh, what if they did this? What if they've done this? Well, just ask, uh, nine out of 10 times people will give you a pretty honest response. And, and if it's not honest, you can typically read the body language. And, and the same with mentorship, just ask, or, um, you know, any, any change you want in your career, just ask. And yeah. it's, um, if you do it the right way, it, it tends to, tends to work out. It's my experience. You, I, I, you can't say what you did a couple of moments ago without me asking, because you said, you know, you should look for parallels in fiction. So, <laughs> it, does, talking... it does beg the obvious question. Have you found any parallels in your career or your time at student universe? Later uh, in fiction no i i that's that's a phenomenal question i'm embarrassed to say i don't have a an obvious good answer to it i in covid having gone through the last <laughs> last nine ten months i i think it's pretty dark whoever wrote that book has, has some serious mental issues uh, but other than that i i yeah it's 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 funny because it's um it's a clash of cultures right it's uh, i grew up in a in a small, relatively speaking, small family business where um, it was very much, I don't know if you're familiar with the Scandinavian law of Yante, so J-A-N-T-E, but it's, um, it's essentially thou, thou shall not think you are anything. And it's all about humility and okay. uh, no bragging, no, no you know, massive aspirations. And, uh, and then I came to Boston and spent a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just, holy You met shit. lots of Americans. <laughs> exactly, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> And one of them ended up being president. Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny, actually, we call it tall poppy syndrome uh, in America. I'm not sure if you've yep. heard that phrasing. All right, all right, you stick your head above it, you'll get your, it cut off. And I'd heard this about Norway, too. And actually, I happen to know that your, uh, your country has an internship program because about three or four years ago, Mozio had two Norwegian interns that the government paid for. And this was the Norwegian government's attempt, ironically, at trying to foster um, you know, a, a reversal of this. So I actually love if you could expand on that. You're, 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 you're kind of already going down that pathway. But could you tell us a little bit more about that cultural change? Like, I think America, you know, maybe, maybe it's particularly exasper exasperated exacerbated in Norway, but I don't think it's actually as unique to only Norway as maybe that may seem. I think there's a lot of other cultures and, and a lot of other people in the travel industry in particular that 
um, you know, might not have the same level of, uh, of entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem as, you know, uh, as we do. Yeah. Look, well, first of all, I think it's changed a lot. And uh, now I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm 69, not 39, but it, I think it's changed immensely since I left Norway um, in, the, in the past 15 years alone. Um, I, I, I sense a very different culture now. I think the, the last 15 years of kind of software slash internet startup uh, spreading throughout Europe, especially Scandinavia, has really changed it. In addition to Norway in particular, having a, a, obviously a phenomenal oil and gas run, which has, has made a lot of people very wealthy. Um, that said, I, I, th I don't think it's unique to Scandinavia at all. I spent just spent a year and a half living in Australia, and you see a lot of the same, see a lot of similarities uh, in, in that as well. Um, the U.S. has kind of obviously had a cowboy culture for, for decades and decades and decades, which has lent itself extraordinarily well to, you know, risk-taking, venture, um, you know, high bravado type uh, enterprises. Um, but, but I think, and some of that has definitely made its way to Europe in a big way, in my, in, in my opinion, which I would say is 70% great. Um, but I think I reserve the 30% for some of the best qualities of the Scandinavia that I grew up in and that my parents grew up in um, are, are typically the humility, the hard work, the, the, the reserved approach to something. And I think um, we need to be really careful so we don't lose that in the process. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think what happens when I, there's just too much of a cowboy culture and you end up with a country refusing to wear masks for one uh, instead of operating collectively. Are we getting political here? Uh, <laughs> a little bit, yeah, you can see, you can see my shirt. Um, but um, yeah, so I want to actually move a little bit into, you know, the transition uh, into flight center. So um, you went from kind of, you know, leading a, well, in comparison, uh, you know, smaller uh, business independently to becoming the COO of a quite big business, one that has a lot of different brands and also one that, you know, was, as you, you kind of alluded to before, undergoing somewhat of a transformation into the digital age. You guys have TMC components, a lot more bureaucratic components. I'd love to hear your perspective on how you've been merging those two cultures. Yeah, it's, it's probably the, the greatest learning from the last five years, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Um, you know, having being a benevolent dictator on the student universe side, you know, team of 200, uh, making five decisions a day and, and really, truly being able to move that, that fast and then coming in to be part of an executive team of, with a pre-COVID team of 20,000 plus is, is a huge contrast. There's just no, um, there's no sugarcoating that. Um, th th there are pockets though. And I think, um, what I've what I've done the last five years is really focus on where do we have either departments, portfolio businesses, uh, or even sections of the company where we have that entrepreneurial spirit can move fast. And I've spent the the majority of my time focusing on stuff like product management and engineering, making that you know a methodology that's repeatable and a system and a team globally that can that can make the group move faster. Um, in addition to, you know, acquiring talent, partnering with the right companies and, and just trying to structure uh, at scale for, for speed, which is extraordinarily challenging. It's, and and I, I would argue Flight Center Travel Group is not even that bureaucratic or, or, um, or formal. It's, it's actually pretty flat and, and has almost a, a, an Australian personality. It's pretty relaxed in many ways. Um, but still, it's, there's, there's no denying it's, uh, it's a very different beast uh, when you have 25 plus brands, tens of thousands of employees and operate across dozens of countries instead of three as we did. So I've, I've tried to understand as best I can, not, not suggesting I've been brilliant at it, but try to understand the best, what, what kind of pieces of both worlds can we join? Uh, so the, the speed and the atmosphere of, of something more entrepreneurial, but the ability to operate at scale, because we don't talk about this a lot and in, in typically in, in younger companies, but operating at scale is, is freaking hard. Um, it's re really cute to, you know, have posters in your office with fail fast and make mistakes and so on and so forth. But when you're doing hundreds of, or tens of millions of dollars of sales a day, that little cute bug from Jane or Jack down the hallway can, can have meaningful impact. So it's, it's not that fun anymore. 
Yeah. What did you learn from, and you know, David made a good point about the contrasting in the different types of businesses. What did you learn from running a, a business where you could make three or four decisions every day with 200 people to the scale that you're now at? Or is it if you had to kind of rewire the way you manage people and divisions or units or whatever? Yeah, I, I think I learned a handful of things. I, I learned that this this obsession that many professionals have about managing people and the, the bigger my team, the more important I feel is a, is a fundamentally flawed one. Um, yep. And managing people, managing human beings is, is really hard. And so structuring smaller pods, smaller teams typically means a greater chance of, of speed and success and, and harmony. Um, I think a lot of companies measure their, their size and number of employees instead of, you know, revenues or, or other metrics that, that show more focus on scalability. I certainly learned that. Uh, even though we were a relatively small player, uh, we, we, we kind of punched above our weight in certain categories in certain moments. And that was, that was something we were proud of. And we typically talked about, you know, how we could double our revenues and hire 5% more people instead of uh, constantly worrying about how to hire the next uh, dozens and dozens of people. Um, yeah, I, I think... Those are some of the some of the key things. Yeah, I mean, I, we should have asked this earlier, but it's it's an interesting one. You acquired We Hostels. Um, I didn't. We, were you the CEO at that point when you? Yeah, bought? yeah. So that was your first acquisition. How did how did you kind of get your head around that? Or was it fairly straightforward? It, it it wasn't straightforward at all. I had um, Diego is just a an artist. He's he's not even a businessman. He's he's an artist. He's a he's a <laughs> bright mind, colorful. Um, Diego and I had a had a few drinks here and there, and just had really interesting conversations. They had, um, and he's gone on to to do great things in several chapters, which is not surprising to me. Uh, but Diego is, a, is an interesting character, and he probably highlighted more than I had seen in my in my role as CEO there. That even though we felt certainly felt pretty young and fit and forward kind of on our toes, not our heels. I quickly realized that we didn't have um, the native application skills and thinking that we needed. And it was quickly becoming table stakes, uh, no longer a sexy little thing to have in your portfolio, but actually, yeah. you know, if we don't get this right, we could be fucked. Yeah. So um, I, we, we went from kind of having casual cute conversations to, me throwing it out there one day that hey instead of you trying to sell hostels at a dollar fifty per room <laughs> which will never never really go anywhere diego why don't we uh why don't we try to apply your your team your iq your vision to to something that's actually starting to get a bit of momentum and yeah we we did that deal um we still have several team members from from the we hostels original uh crew and um yeah, it's. I think it was a a smart deal um, from from a, an IP talent tech acquisition perspective. Yeah, he. I mean, David. He's he's someone we should absolutely get on here at some point because um, he's. I, I've known him for quite a long time, and he's always got some stories to tell. And he's like, yeah, he's a storyteller. My yeah, God. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, last one from me for a bit. I mean, that was the only acquisition I think that you made. That was the only right, the, the, yep. yeah is there, was there was it just because that one was as you just you know indicated it had all the right things at the right time you know people and you know you needed a mobile solution and all this kind of stuff were there just no other opportunities that ever came along that were just worth um putting your hands in your pockets and saying okay let's have a go at trying to buy these people no there were there were plenty of opportunities there were um, i looked at dozens and i was probably um, the, the the most eager as a young CEO that thought M and A was really cool and it sounded yeah. cool. Um, one of our board members was um, uh, at the time he became a Harvard Business School professor. I believe he was the youngest Harvard Business School professor um, ever to to became to become a professor. Um, this um, very very smart, uh, sane, calm German uh, dude. Um, that gave me a lot of advice, one of my mentors throughout the year. And, and one of his pieces of advice pretty early on as I took the, took the role was, uh, look, M&A 
typically fails. And when it when people claim it didn't, they're 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 polishing a turd. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it it's just not a great way of, of growing your business. It's really hard work, um, and and especially when you're kind of medium sized, not extra large. Um, this is really hard work, and and you need to be really careful. He he wasn't being prescriptive or, or giving instructions. He was just more warning me. And, and that came back for a lot of these deals. I think we were, we were all excited about the idea of, you know, adding talented people and tech to it. But uh, the second we started having detailed conversations around integration, integration of team, of tech, of platforms and, and growth, um, growth plans, uh, it, it quickly became obvious that, you know what, uh, we can probably do a lot of this organically. Now, there was one big acquisition that you were involved in, which was the acquisition of Student University itself by Flight Centre. So how did, was that a long process given that Flight Centre is a publicly listed company and all those kind of things? When did the first kind of conversations happen? Yeah, it was, it was a relatively long process. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. And not, not, for, not for the wrong reasons. I just think it, we, we tangled a little bit from everything from process to price to terms to next steps. Um, it, was, it, was a unique, um, it was a unique exposure to the founder, CEO, and the group. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, so the CEO is a Graham Turner, but he goes by Screw. Uh, his nickname is Screw. And uh, where we, we obviously ran a process, we, uh, we had a you know, proper Dex and put on our nice, nice suits uh, and shirts and pitch to a bunch of people to try to sell this for as much as possible. Um, and we would have private equity firms fly in from other U.S. cities, come into Boston. They would show up at our, at our office, um, spend three or four hours in management meetings, and then rush to the airport to go back to their, to their you know, whether it was Chicago or San Francisco. And that was my, that was kind of my first three months of experience with with running a process to to find a new home for student universe and i didn't think too much about it and then along sorry, comes if i could sorry if, forgive me for interrupting um i should have asked you really why were you looking why were you looking to sell oh uh, the, the there were a few reasons uh one obviously our investors were, were saying hey we've been in this game for for a long time now it's it's probably good for us to look uh you've you've taken the company from kind of borderline plateauing to, to resuming some growth and there's some healthy numbers here. Why don't we take that opportunity to, to okay. look? Yeah. So that was one. Um, the other part was we hadn't done a lot of what I thought was right for, for the business. Geographic expansion, um, some, some more targeted M&A, uh, new categories, and so on and so forth. And a, a lot of a, a key reason for that is we just didn't have a huge amount of capital and we didn't have the commercial connections or the network uh, to operate globally. So uh, we thought a strategic buyer would make a ton of sense. And uh, I think a lot of the team members deserved a, a new chapter with a kind mm -hmm. of uh, fo growth focused um, backer. So um, yeah, they would come in, they would meet with us, and they would rush to the airport and get out, right? <laughs> and then along comes this flight center travel group um, guys. And first, I dealt with some lovely people in the in the um, corporate development department. We had great conversations. And then at some point, we got so far that I I flew down to to Australia. And in contrast to every other potential, or every suitor that we had in the past, this guy would go out to lunch, to dinner, every day for three or four days when I was there and we would have bottle after bottle after bottle of wine. And the same evening I would have dinner with this family and it was just a fundamental change. It was, it was fundamentally different from a, these guys give a shit. Um, they, they want this to work and it wasn't theater. It wasn't a show. It felt, uh, it felt real. It felt heart, heartfelt. And um, I think that's a lesson for a lot of, not just acquirers, but for a lot of companies looking for an exit is, mm -hmm. it's not just about the money. Um, if you want your team to be happy post change of control, if you want it to feel right, you have to focus as much on, on trust and atmosphere and culture. And uh, long story short, that's, that's what we found. Um, and it, 
it felt right at that point, and it's it's been a really good um, it's been a really good story, and and perhaps most importantly, it's been a really good acquisition for a flight center travel group. So I actually wanted to go a little deeper on this. It's funny. Um, I being reflecting here, we have we often ask the question, and we go into fundraises as nominal as like very big moments in the in the people we interviews kind of uh, careers. And I think this is also a similar focus uh, in startups in general there. I don't know how many blogs or books there are about how to raise a seed round or a series A round or something like that. Um, I remember a few years ago, we explored selling Mozio and I was told that there's really only one book about selling. It was called the magic box paradigm. And I'm not <laughs> sure if you ever uh, actually read that, but um, basically it gives you a bunch of unintuitive feedback about like, don't drive for the term sheep as they'll just lock you up. And then you, then potentially, you know, you force them to make a decision too early. There's a lot of you know feedback in, in there. And, you know, I kind of want, it sounded like you started a process that wasn't fruitful. I, I got the feeling that those private equity guys weren't rushing out of the room to go uh, prepare a term sheet, but just to, it sounded like the way you phrased it, it was, it was a waste of time and like it didn't go anywhere. And then it was the relationship building that was over a long term. Like in retrospect here, you know, you gave a little bit of advice uh, right there. It was, you know, it's about the you know real relationship thinking forward. How would you have gone about this differently? Like other than the private equity, you know, would you not have done any of those things? Would you not have uh, done a process? Would you have tried to do partnership first and do those integrations first? But as you said, you know, often your own M&A deals fell apart when you like actually started, you know, opening up the hood of the car. How would you recommend someone trying to sell their company uh, go about this having been on both sides of that equation? Yeah, well, I think the this, the honest answer is very often you don't get to control exactly those parameters yourself, right? You typically have a board or you have institutional investors that want you to run a full traditional process. So, but if you if you academically speaking had the chance to do whatever you wanted, um, I think you know straight human dialogue, um, finding potential suitors, investors, or buyers that are that understand what you do. It sounds so silly or also blatantly obvious, but a lot of the institutional investors or a lot of financial buyers, they're, they're, they know better than anyone in the world how to read your P&L, your balance sheet and, and model how they can put some, some leverage on the business post change of control and, and make it something from a spreadsheet perspective. But if they don't understand your business, your team, your path to growth, um, that's something that you need to take deeply into consideration. Um, are you just looking for an exit or are you looking for a next chapter? And they're fundamentally different in my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't regret no one. I don't think anyone on our side regrets running a process. I think we learned a lot from it and we ended up um, finding a really great home for student universe. Um, but it's, it's time consuming. And I think, uh, and, and it requires a lot of your focus and your bandwidth. Anyone that's fundraised knows, knows what I'm talking about. It's not, it's not a pleasant experience. Um, fortunately, we had a, a relatively happy ending, which um, makes it all easier to look back on, but it's, um, it's not for the faint heart. Thank you very much for joining us this week. We really appreciate you uh, coming on the show, Adley. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, this has been How I Got Here. That's Mozio and FocusWise weekly podcast where we talk to the entrepreneurs and innovators in travel and transportation. If you, this is your first time with us, you can subscribe to the podcast at all the usual places. That's Spotify, Amazon, Alexa, Google Podcasts and iTunes. So please go on there and subscribe. Uh, we'll be back next week with an upper episode. But on behalf of David and I, thank you very much again to Atley. And uh, this has been another episode and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.